for coming out tonight to our uh, second book talk of the season. Uh, my name is Sammy Tai of the Bookstore Director of Middle East Books and More. Uh, tonight um, we're going to have a book talk with um, uh, Michael, uh, Dr. Michael Fishbach um, from uh, Randolph uh, Micken. Mick <laughs> like Bacon. Uh, ah, Micken uh, College. <laughs> Thanks. Um, he, tonight he'll talk about his most recent book, uh, The Movement in the Middle East. Uh, how the Arab-Israeli conflict divided the American left. Um, uh, a little bit about uh, Dr. Fischbach. Um, he is a professor of history at Randolph uh, Micken College in Ashland, Virginia, where he has taught since 1992 after receiving his doctorate in modern Middle Eastern history from Georgetown University. He researches issues relating to land and property ownership in the modern Middle East, particularly in connection with Israel-Palestine, Jordan and the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, he is the author of Jewish Property Claims Against Arab Countries, um, published by Columbia University Press, uh, The Peace Process and Palestinian Refugee Claims, Addressing Claims for Property Compensation and Restitution, uh, published by the United, Institute, United States Institute for, uh, of Peace Press, um, and also Records of Dispossession, Palestinian Refugee Property and the Arab-Israeli Conflict, by Columbia University Press, and um, and also uh, State Society and Land in Jordan uh, by Brill, uh, among other publications. Uh, his two books on Palestinian refugee property have also been translated into Arabic. Uh, Fischbach also researches how the Arab-Israeli conflict divided the black freedom movement and left-wing white radicals in America during the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, prior to publishing the movement in the Middle East, he authored Black Power in Palestine, Transnational Cunt Countries of Color uh, by Stanford University Press. Um, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Fischbach. Thanks, Sammy. It's great to be here. Great to be with all you folks. As he mentioned, I did my graduate work at Georgetown, and um, while D.C. has changed every time I come here, one thing has not changed, and that is parking in this area <laughs> in Adams Morgan. So fortunately, they had a garage space for me. Um, it's really my pleasure to be here to talk about this book, and as an historian, I would be remiss if I didn't begin with a story. In November of 1966, Daniel Rubin, a member of the Central Committee of the Communist Party USA, decried what he considered American Jews, quote, upside-down approach to Israel and support of the Jewish state as a progressive country facing a sea of ignorant and reactionary Arabs. Quote, by accepting this picture, Rubin declared, Jews in the U.S., usually unwittingly, find themselves on the side of U.S. imperialism and in opposition to national liberation movements and on the side of rabid Cold War anti-communist warriors. Rubin was upholding the CP's party line, which was that the interests of Jews both in the United States and Israel was not to support the Jewish state blindly, but to see that the real issue in the Middle East was one of national liberation against global imperialism. Rubin also waxed personal in his late 1966 comments by noting, quote, as an American Jewish communist, I feel ashamed and angry that a Jewish government coming from a people who've known so much oppression should oppress Arabs within Israel and play the U.S. imperialist game of supporting their oppression in neighboring countries. The party bosses agreed with him. Indeed, when Israel struck first in the June 1967 war, the official CP line was that Israel had been the aggressor following the Soviet party line. But not all Jewish communists agreed. Comrade Sid Resnick, for one, vehemently disagreed. For him, Israel was merely defending itself in the spring of 1967 against a threatened Arab genocide. Quote, the Arab chauvinist threat to Israel's existence was real in May and June of 1967, he said. Continuing, Resnick said, in fact, de-Zionizing the state of Israel and converting it into an Arab-Palestine state is impossible without destroying the people and the state of Israel. And pointing beyond the Communist Party to the entire American left, Resnick intoned, Within left-wing movements, Jewish and non-Jewish radicals ought to challenge that sham internationalism which glorifies Palestinian Arab terrorists 
and runs interference for Arab chauvinism. Indeed, Resnick quit the CP and a years later after the war said, quote, I thought the party was wrong in completely condemning Israel as the aggressor. The point of this little story is that the fact that two Jewish members of the same left-wing political party held such divergent and mutually antagonistic views on the Arab-Israeli conflict is illustrative of a major problem that bedeviled the entire American left, at least the white left, and helped to weaken it in the 1960s and 1970s, ironically at a time when it was at its strongest in decades. Which side, Israel or the Palestinians, deserved the support of left-wing activists during that tumultuous period of time? Now, while everybody on the left could agree on the need to end the war in Vietnam, support the black freedom struggle, and create a, a new politics within the United States, what to do about the Middle East proved to be immensely divisive among left-wing and progressive Americans. How far did left-wing internationalism extend? Did it apply across the board, or was one country, Israel, somehow exempt from that kind of scrutiny? Indeed, support for global revolution versus what I call Israel exceptionalism proved to be a major source of contention and division within the left five decades ago. And the fact that Jews were disproportionately well represented on the left worsened this friction as a virtual Jewish civil war broke out over the question of the Middle East. And in the long run, I argue that these divisions within the left raised public consciousness about the Arab-Israeli conflict and permanently altered how progressives view the conflict, even while paradoxically weakening the left at that time. So this evening, I'd like to talk first a little bit about some of the varying left-wing or at least white left-wing attitudes toward the conflict in the 60s and explain why these attitudes had such a tremendous impact on these activists' divergent agendas, identities, and understandings. Because indeed, while a foreign policy issue, how these radicals understood and related to the Arab-Israeli conflict also reflected a sense of their own identity. And then I'd like to conclude with some thoughts about how all of this that happened five decades ago is still relevant, uh, if not within the actual left in America today, which is minuscule, but at least among progressive Americans are still facing these kinds of challenges. So almost as soon as the June 1967 war was over, splits emerged within the American left over how to deal with it. These grew particularly deep several months later after some black militants with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and black militants at the National New, Conference Politi New Politics Conference in Chicago, uh, both in August and September of 67, roundly denounced Israel, much to the shock and horror of some on the white left. This sense of where we come down as a left on the Arab-Israeli conflict became shortly uh, a marker, really, of whether or not one was committed to a universal restructuring of the globe, uh, which pro-Palestinian leftists tended to advocate, or whether in one's search for global justice, anti-imperialism, support for the third world, whether that kind of activism stopped at the borders of Israel. And let's look at some of the different developments and groups uh, and how they stood and how they interacted with one another uh, to illustrate more. Certainly youthful, new left activists were some of the first who quickly joined with black militants in hailing the Palestinian struggle and denouncing Israel. The Yippies, for instance, most famous uh, for their wild and crazy antics, their hairstyles, uh, but few remember today that figures like Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin uh, were solidly on the side of the Palestinians. Indeed, Hoffman once said, quote, I hate Israel, and I want to see the Palestinians triumph. He also added, I am violently anti-Israel and no longer believe they have a right to exist. And Jerry Rubin noted, quote, I do not believe in freedom for Jews at the expense of Arabs, and also quipped, quote, if Moses were alive today, he'd be an Arab guerrilla. <laughs> now, the Yippies are illustrative of the fact that while championing the Palestinians, they, like others on the left, really didn't do much to actualize that. Their time was spent working against the war and other things. 
This was also true of the most notable New Left student group, SDS, the Students for a Democratic Society, another highly visible example of the New Left in the 60s. Starting in mid-1967, SDS leaders uh, within the Lucianet organization also began pushing SDS to stand on the side of the Palestinians, consistent with the growing New Left support for Third World revolutionaries. An SDS publication in late 1967, for instance, put out by a professor, Larry Hochman, an ex-Zionist himself, said, quote, a Jewish state has been established in the midst of the Arab world without the invitation or consent of the indigenous population. Driving home its anti-imperialist analysis, Hochman's document continued by saying, quote, the Jewish immigration occurred and could only have occurred under the aegis of Western colonial control. Two years later, the pages of the SDS publication New Left Notes uh, exploded with a series of articles similarly denouncing Israel and championing, indeed hailing, the Palestinian refugee struggle uh, put out uh, by an SDS activist um, who is, well, anyway, um, she herself was Jewish and she ended up marrying uh, a not notable left-wing activist who's still around uh, named Mike Konsky. Um, and in these articles, she compared what Zionism had done to the Palestinians with what white settlers had done to American Indians at home. Now, that's not to say that there was an opposition. Indeed, uh, New Left Notes began to feature ed letters to the editor roundly criticizing uh, uh, Susan Ennett, that was her name, Susan Ennett's uh, pieces. One complained that she's, quote, presenting the Zionists as racist bad guys and the Arabs as anti-imperialist good guys. <laughs> So the lines were being drawn uh, in the white left over this volatile issue. Beyond the Yippies and SDS, the student movement was another very visible aspect of youth discontent and protest in the 1960s. And it was another indication of the growing divisions among left-wing activists about how to understand the Arab-Israeli conflict. Pro-Palestinian campus uh, events began blossoming on college campuses, particularly starting in 1969. In the spring of 1969, a number of universities staged what they called Palestine Weeks, uh, including schools such as Berkeley, UCLA, Madison, Columbia, and the University of Chicago. Student groups emerged elsewhere, uh, such as the American Friends of Free Palestine at the University of Virginia, and the Palestine Solidarity Coalition at the University of Indiana at Bloomington. Yet here, too, there was a collision, as indeed over 110 new pro-Israeli groups emerged uh, in the last two years of 1969 and the first year of 1970. Left-wing groups like Am Yisrael at SUNY Albany and the Jewish Student Movement at Northwestern, my undergraduate alma mater, by the way, uh, emerged and vociferously countered that one could be solidly on the side of Third World Revolution, against the war in Vietnam, and yet still believe uh, that Israel uh, has the monopoly of right and goodness in the Middle East. In fact, so divisive did the Arab-Israeli conflict become on some college campuses that a teach-in on the Middle East at Columbia in April 1969 actually descended into fistfights among those in attendance. And you thought conflict at Columbia was new, right? <laughs> Clearly, the new left was split over the Middle East, even as they agreed on so much else, including the war in Vietnam. This kind of divisiveness, as my first story indicated, also emerged within the so-called old left, the socialist and Marxist parties whose origins go back to the early part of the 20th century. Uh, the Workers' World Party, for instance, was a, uh, a neo-Trotskyist organization um, that took its positions to the streets. In fact, carried out the only known that I could find protest against Israel that actually occurred while the 67 war was still going on. Uh, the WWP's newsletter noted in 67, during the war in June, that, quote, the state of Israel is on the side of the oppressors and against the oppressed. The historical oppression of Jews might cloud this issue, but does not change it. One of their rivals, the Socialist Workers' Party, also lined up solidly behind um, the Palestinians. In speaking of the Palestinian Nakba of 1948, 
a SWP spokesman pointed out to his fellow leftists in 1970 that, quote, progress and socialism does not mean the expulsion of a people from their native territory. Not surprisingly, there were others on the old left, though, who lined up solidly behind Israel and saw it as a progressive socialist country uh, defending its very existence against totalitarian um, Arab dictatorships. And among the old left parties, nowhere did this tension create more problems than, as I mentioned earlier, the Communist Party USA, which underwent tremendous internecine conflict in the last years of the 1960s. Because party leaders like Gus Hall and Harry Winston, following the Soviet line, upheld Israel's right to exist, but denounced it for having started the 67 war and stating that the Palestinians had paid the price for the establishment of Israel, quote, based on the displacement of Arabs to make room for Jews, uh, to facilitate the racist concept of a purely Jewish state. But many, particularly Jewish comrades, on the other hand, within the party, rebelled. And there was a kind of uprising, an intifada, if you will, within the CP. <laughs> Some claimed that while they, they were, quote, pro-Israel, but non-Zionist, saying that we on the left here in the Communist Party, we are pro-Israel as a, 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 country, a fellow country of Jews, as a socialist country, but we're not Zionists, but nonetheless balked at the official party line. And the split within the CP never actually really was healed. And the ever watchful FBI, which by its own admission had several hundred informants within the CP, stated, quote, it was a crisis of the first order of magnitude. And indeed, the FBI was actually working to um, facilitate further splits. In the old left, though, nobody was more solidly on the side of Israel and virulently hostile to Palestinian aspirations than the Socialist Party of America and some of its offshoots in the early 70s, like uh, the, uh, uh, the Democratic Socialist Organizing Committee and the Social Democrats USA. For them, the proper left-wing choice was eminently clear, and following on the increasingly pro-Israeli line of the Socialist International, the SPA, almost from the beginning, uh, stood on the side of Israel, um, and this too reflected not only a principled sense that here was a, a, a socialist country facing reactionary Arabs, but also reflected the socialists' decades-long hostility toward the Communist Party. What the Communist Party did, almost by re by definition, the SPA took the opposite side and saw Soviet support for Arab states like <coughs> Egypt and Syria as ever more reason to back Israel. So from all these parties on the old left, we see that like the youthful new left, there was considerable conflict over the proper stance for socialists, Marxists, and other left-wing persons about how are we supposed to deal with this recent war and indeed the wider conflict. I might add, that outside of the true left, uh, let's say, move a little bit further to the right, let's just say progressives and liberals, uh, there similarly were these kinds of fairly vicious debates. Um, this was particularly true of the movement to end the Vietnam War. One pacifist noted succinct, succinctly that, quote, raising the question of the Middle East at peace meetings seems to lead to a most disconcerting silence. <laughs> The balancing act characterized uh, over what to do um, the major anti-war group in the mid-late 60s known as the MOB. Uh, the MOB exerted great efforts on what it called uh, to focus on the single issue, end the war and that's it, no other subsidiary issues. The, the Workers' World Party was in the MOB and argued strongly to uh, discuss Israel uh, alongside Vietnam. The Socialist Workers' Party, the Communist Party, even though they had their own criticism of Israel, worked hard not to let that happen for fear it would split the anti-war movement. Uh, others within the anti-war movement similarly didn't know what to do. Martin Luther King Jr. faced the dilemma of how to remain morally consistent uh, as a Nobel Prize, uh, Peace Prize winner, how he could remain morally consistent to opposing war and including the use of American aircraft to drop napalm in Vietnam when Israel was using American aircraft to drop napalm against Arabs. Indeed, he also worried about keeping his, his, his stature. Black power militants were pressuring him from one side, uh, Americans, uh, donors, liberals, 
uh, including Jewish supporters of, of civil rights, uh, were pressuring him from the other. And King tried to have it both ways, noting in September of 1967 that, quote, neither military measures, which was talking to Israel, nor a stubborn effort to reverse history, which was talking to the Arabs, can provide a permanent solution for people who need and deserve both development and security. King basically tried to have it both ways, talked about security and peace for Israel, but looking at his own experience dealing with black youth rebelling in the streets of America, said the Arab world will continue to be hostile and do hostile things as long as there is, is a lack of development. So while not recognizing and speaking publicly to Palestinian political grievances, uh, King did try to balance his support for Israel's right to exist with uh, a self-proclaimed economic program, um, a la Jared Kushner, to help the Palestinians. <laughs> the noted anti-war group Women Strike for Peace also tried officially to stay neutral, and local chapters adopted various perspectives. Some, however, um, liberals, notably, um, were quite supportive of Israel. Uh, indeed, uh, noted members of Congress, such as Senator Robert Kennedy, Senator Eugene McCarthy, Senator George McGovern, uh, were strongly pro-Israeli. And in fact, so worried were certain liberals about this, this problem of being so against the war in Vietnam, as the above mentioned were, and yet supportive of Israel, that in June of 1967, just two weeks after the war ended, a rally was held in New York called Israel and Vietnam, there is a difference, at which the, uh, these people tried to make the claim that support for the war in the Middle East is not inconsistent with hostility to the war in Southeast Asia. Others, I might add, weren't buying it and dismissed these people as, quote, doves for war. <laughs> Others, however, spoke out forthrightly, notably the famous pacifist priest uh, Daniel Berrigan who a bit later, in, in October of 1973, in the midst of another war in the Middle East, um, roundly condemned both sides in, in prophetic terms. Um, no one took him to task for criticizing the Arab states, but his, his criticism of Israel uh, gained him a, a strong degree of opprobrium, uh, and uh, people such as Rabbi Balfour Brickner, who had worked with him in the anti-war movement, uh, publicly distance themselves from him. Let me also note that besides the new left, the old left, the student movement, the, 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 war, the movement to end the war, the women's movement similarly saw uh, this kind of vicious um, debates frequently again with Jewish women on both sides of the issue, although generally this occurred later in the 70s uh, into the um, early 1980s. Um, so the fact that it was so divisive was magnified by what I just said. The fact that we had Jews, progressive and left-wing Jews, hailing both sides, a kind of Jewish civil war. Um, some of the earliest attacks, in fact, on left-wing criticism of Israel came from, from Jewish academics. Uh, Michael Walzer and Martin Peretz, for instance, took to the pages of the famous left-wing magazine Ramparts uh, a month after the war and blasted the left for its attacks on Israel, saying, quote, those of us in the radical community then for whom Israel's rights are on the same moral plane as the rights of the Vietnamese have drawn a kind of moral cutoff line on this issue. Other radicals cannot deny or reasonably plead against it in the name of unity. Um, Academics such as Seymour Martin Lipset, for instance, and Nathan Glazer, who later you know, moved into neoconservatism, similarly blasted liberal and left-wing Jews and pathologized them for being self-hating Jews who were affected by their upbringing and were rebelling against their parents. <laughs> Other Jews on the left, however, countered by bravely urging their fellow compatriots to honestly examine their own pro-Zionist feelings. Just days after the 67 war, the noted writer I.F. Stone noted, for instance, quote, it was a moral tragedy to which no Jew worthy of our best prophetic tradition could be insensitive, that a kindred people was made homeless in the task of making new homes for the remnants of the Hitler Holocaust. Still other Jews on the left, the likes of Paul Jacobs, uh, Arthur Laskow, and Noam Chomsky, for instance, uh, argued for a dispassionate 
public, open discussion of the Arab-Israeli conflict in the name of academic and intellectual honesty. Well, as the 60s faded into the 1970s, America was changing, um, the nature of the left was changing, uh, yet this issue remained alive even then. Uh, Post-New Left radicals uh, continued to hail the Palestinians, including the bombers of the Weather Underground, for instance, and some of the above-ground parties that formed the so-called New Communist Movement in the 1970s, like the Revolutionary Communist Party USA of Bob Avakian, who which is still out there floating around today. Um, but what is interesting is that even as the left was metamorphosizing and really withering away in the neoliberal backlash starting with Nixon and Reagan, what's interesting is that the question of raising questions about the Middle East, hard questions of Israel, expressions of support for the Palestinians, began to drift in from the left into the, let's call it the liberal and progressive mainstream. Uh, I'm thinking in the 1970s, particularly with the discourse of human rights, uh, especially after President Carter was the first president to speak openly of legitimate national and human rights for the Palestinian people. We had groups such as um, the uh, National Lawyers Guild sending a, a delegation to investigate human rights abuses in the occupied territories in 1977 and its uh, red book on this issue became as uh, NLG figure Abdin Jabbar once said uh, a touchstone for the, in the entire left. Uh, that same year 1977 Jabara and others um, formed the Palestine Human Rights Campaign uh, at which uh, then young uh, James Ogby cut his teeth and later uh, involved people such as the Reverend Donald Wagner, who, especially under Wagner, the PHRC not only continued to talk to a diverse group of people, mostly Americans, uh, who were not openly left-wing, but let's say generally liberal, uh, but also under Wagner's leadership, the PHRC began bringing in churches, including mainline Protestant churches, of which he himself was, was a minister. In other words, ironically, as the left raised this issue and was consumed by fighting, um, once the 60s died down and even the 60s left really dissipated, the issue particularly of examining the legitimate claims of Palestinians had floated into the liberal mainstream where it is remains today. And with that, I want to conclude by saying that um, beyond the weakening of the left, five decades ago, this dissension proved significant uh, in other ways. Certainly one of them is the more open way that pro-Palestinian viewpoints can be discussed publicly today, and that is a direct result of what happened in the 60s and 70s. Uh, to wit, this very bookstore's existence would have been unheard of in 1970. Whereas such talk at the time was coming from the mouths of radicals and was considered quite revolutionary and novel and extreme, Support for Palestinians today and strong questions of Israel um, have moved out of the left and not even within the progressive mainstream, but in some ways into the actual mainstream. Certainly the formation of groups uh, such as the November 29th Coalition in 1981, the Students for Justice in Palestine in 1993, and civil society supporters of the BDS movement, what everyone thinks of BDS, in 2005 certainly all illustrate that the discourse of Palestinian rights today has become really a permanent part of the American landscape. Speaking particularly of the atmosphere on American campuses, uh, the noted Palestinian-American historian Rashid Khalidi noted in, 19, in 2015 uh, the extent to which the landscape has changed. And he said, and I'm quoting him, there's a much higher level of discussion of matters related to Palestine than ever before especially in the field of Middle East studies and among students on many campuses. One today can discuss these topics on campuses, in the classroom and outside, at a reasonably high level and without overt friction, and that would have been completely off limits just 20 years ago. That is certainly true, but on the other hand, um, even Halliday would admit that pro-Israeli forces symbiotically also have become much more organized and powerful over the decades since the 1960s and work to combat pro-Palestinian perspectives. Uh, the same things that so mortified them when they first heard them five decades ago, 
they've developed quite sophisticated mechanisms to try to combat them today. Indeed, internet sites designed to monitor, expose, and counteract pro-Palestinian professors and students and activities uh, have become almost mainstream, including groups like Campus Watch and starting in early 2015, the Secretive Canary Mission. To conclude, in presenting the story of the 1960s and 70s left, I've tried to show that left-wing identity at the time uh, and action were thrown into sharp relief by how activists responded individually and collectively uh, to the Middle East. And that these uh, fissures and conflicts were worsened by the fact um, that a good percentage of the old left and the new left, disproportionately well represented by Jewish Americans, for whom their own personal and collective histories e evinced a variety of, at times, quite contradictory attitudes toward Israel. Today, what remains of the tiny American left is mostly solidly united around one discourse, and that is a discourse of support for the Palestinians. But within, let's leave the, the little tiny left, today in 2020, let's say among progressives and liberals more widely, um, the Arab-Israeli conflict is just as divisive as it was 50 years ago, and I submit that what happened 50 years ago is a cautionary tale for liberals and progressives today. And I think nowhere is that, come on in, nowhere is that better seen than in today's Democratic Party. When the 2018 elections brought into the House of Representatives three Democratic women who had publicly ex uh, expressed support for the Palestinians, Ilhan Omar, Alexandre Ocasio-Cortez, and the Congress's first Palestinian-American woman, uh, Rashida Tlaib, some high-level Democratic Party bosses were alarmed. It represented a trend by which three important constituencies within the party, young people, women, and people of color, were abandoning the Democratic Party's traditionally strong pro-Israeli stance. And indeed, within literally days after those three women were sworn into Congress in January of 2019, a new organization called the Democratic Majority for Israel was established to shore up support for Israel within the party, something at once was taken for granted. Furthermore, Democratic presidential hopeful Bernie Sanders, himself Jewish but not actually a member of the Democratic Party, has called for conditioning U.S. foreign aid to Israel upon that country's need to, quote, fundamentally change its policy toward the Palestinians. Clearly, traditional liberals within the Democratic Party are mortified. Uh, and they have reason to be. According to a 2018 poll carried out by the Pew Research Center, the number of self-described liberal Democrats who sympathize with the Palestinians was nearly twice the number who said they supported with Israel. Another Pew poll from April 2019 showed that just 27% of Americans under the age of 30 held a favorable view of the Israeli government. <coughs> Traditional pro-Israeli members of the party decry this trend and have worked hard to fight against it. Presidential hopeful Joe Biden has noted in reaction to Sanders' call for conditioning U.S. aid on Israel's treatment of Palestinians, quote, the idea that we would draw military aid assistance from Israel on the condition that they change a specific policy I find to be absolutely outrageous. And indeed, the group I mentioned, the Democratic Majority for Israel, has begun airing attack ads against um, Bernie Sanders. And quite recently, at least as of yesterday, uh, there was another contender uh, who roundly has supported Israel in his life, and, and that was Michael Bloomberg. My point is that progressives today, whether inside the Democratic Party or outside, who are seeking unity in the name of fighting the Trump agenda and defeating him in the November elections, would do well to consider the weakening of the left five decades ago if they want to create this kind of unified party. Whatever else one thinks of people like uh, Rashida Tlaib or Bernie Sanders, their problems with the Democratic Party's mainstream go deeper than merely their attitudes towards socialism versus capitalism. Uh, they represent, and again, whether you like this or not, uh, you're supportive of Sanders or Biden, they represent constituencies youth, people of color, women, um, 
who are the rising voice within that party? And again, the party needs to deal with that. They talk about healing and coming together. That is one of the issues, although you don't see it in the news as much, that is similarly bedeviling the Democratic Party here in the months before the election. And that is, what is the proper stance toward Israel? And I might add that with President Trump so deeply ensconced with the right-wing policies and visions of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and with the left both outside and within the United States virtually unanimous in support of the Palestinians, pro-Israeli progressives are in a strange position of supporting a country that has the unreserved support of President Trump, while at the same time seeking to unseat him in the elections. So, like American politics, the Middle East is changing, uh, things are in turmoil, and progressive Americans today, I argue, uh, would do well to consider the lessons of disunity five decades ago uh, as they look to a joint progressive force to blunt President Trump, whether within the party or not. Uh, there are important historical lessons from long ago uh, about disunity uh, over this issue, contending visions, and ultimately what progressives are supposed to stand for. And with that, I thank you for your attention. I'm curious to hear what you have to say. So thanks very much. Thank Do you want to moderate, or? Um, the only thing I have, I mean, you can, when people raise their hands, you can just call All them right. out. But um, I just request that, you know, everyone keep their questions to a question opposed to a statement. I have two questions. Yes. I have two questions. Yes, ma'am. Do you think that some of the angst within the Communist Party was because the Soviet Union voted yes for the partition plan? Oh, gosh. And, oh. and the second question is this business of Palestinian refugees in Gaza, the West Bank, there's a lot of sympathy, but there's absolutely no concern about those in Lebanon who are the original Nakba 48 people. Mm -hmm. um, I did consider about a research on the, the American Communist Party, the, mm -hmm. the, the Soviet position on Zionism before. I, I didn't include it so much in the book. Um, most Marxists and anarchists and many socialists, historically in the 30s and so on, uh, were anti-Zionist. Uh, now that began to change with the impending defeat of the Nazis, uh, the Holocaust, and the Soviet position on Zionism itself didn't change, but the Soviet policy did these zigzags, you know, support for or, uh, an independent unified Pal uh, Palestine, and then suddenly they approved a pro uh, partitioning, and then almost immediately after the war when Israel went into the American orbit, certainly during the Korean War, the Soviets kind of went back to being uh, quite hostile. Um, so, yeah, I think for many, particularly Jewish party members, and there were, by their own e estimates, probably a third to a half of the American Communist Party were Jewish members, have been confused over the years about mm -hmm. what is the Soviet Union really doing? Um, things that are outside the book, such as the show trials in the 50s, anti-Semitism in Poland, um, there was a lot else the, the revelations of Stalin's crimes after 56 by Khrushchev disillusioned many communist members um, to what the party really was supposed to be standing for anyway. So it's a long answer to your question, but I think that kind of confusion added to this. Um, as for the refugees, um, I, I didn't get much into that in the book. I mean, I've certainly talked about it, um, and certainly you know, if you don't mind me saying, uh, Ms. Siegel is actually in the book. Um, and was one of the uh, uh, witnesses uh, uh, to the Sabra massacre and herself was nearly uh, murdered by the Falange uh, and later testified to the Kahan Commission in Israel. So um, I would defer to you on comments about the refugees, but um, certainly people like I have stone raised the point that you know, the refugees from the Holocaust to be settled in a place and displace another people and create other refugees, he was very conscious of that. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, Two-part question. Yes. I think the two parts are very closely linked. Uh, the first part is just to expand on your point about the people who are now activists with regard to Palestinian rights taking, uh, taking account of the lessons of the period that you've been mm -hmm. describing uh, tonight. Uh, and, and what are those lessons? I, I, maybe I came in late and you may have outlined them. But that's the first part of it. And the second part of it is 
how relevant are those to this new situation that I would argue uh, what you've described at the end of, of your talk is uh, overwhelming the result of generational change and the, and the rise of a new generation whose values are so totally different from previous generations. And I wonder if that wouldn't suggest that a whole new uh, approach might mm -hmm. be justified. Uh, uh, well, this was one of the things about the, the new left in the 60s was that it approached so much differently. And a lot of the, both the old left and even liberals just, you know, I mean, national liberation, support for national liberation, I mean, well, you know, this was in some ways new to them. And, um, but as far as when I talked about it being a cautionary tale, I carefully didn't offer advice to liberals or the Democrats, and I haven't said what I think, but I would, I think you raised a good point. Um, I, I think they would do well as uh, the older generation didn't always do well in the 60s, particularly Jewish liberals hearing uh, radical Jews condemning Israel and just pathologize it, you're self-hating, you must, something's wrong with you. I, I think the Democratic Party in particular today would do well to avoid the kind of patronizing, no, 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 the young people are, you know, we're not here to talk about capitalism, we're not here to, you know, the Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, Bernie Sanders, and I would argue the pro-Palestine discourse is really forcing a discussion among progressives and Democrats. We really have to not just look at traditional things about whatever labor unions, or, we need to ask huge questions about the entire system. And I think uh, whatever you think of them, you like them, you don't like them, the Sanders type of people are saying we have to re-examine the nature of capitalism, the nature of health care, the nature of race relations, and the nature of Americans' attitudes to the Arab Israeli conflict. And so, uh, whatever the Democratic Party chooses to do with these, que with these new voices, um, simply, I guess, what I, the closest I would come to advice would be doing what happened in the 60s and some people just pathologizing these new voices didn't seem to be effective then and I would submit wouldn't be now. So that's as close as I'll come to offering some prescriptive advice. Um, Yes, sir. Yes. Um, so, do you think that any of the kind of the, I guess, the, like you know, the left's kind of reaction or kind of like you know, very pro-Palestinian kind of change, is it all in reaction to kind of like the kind of right-wing um, administration of Netanyahu and his kind of close affiliation with Trump? Is that do you think that plays like a significant factor into that, or is it more just? Um, I recently wrote a chapter for a book that's coming out this year, um, that in which I examined the roots of one particular, uh, what you might call Israel advocacy, or there's a Hebrew term, Haspala, um, and that is an appeal to the global intersectionality movement. This is very much bedeviled, uh, strongly pro-Israeli activists, that particularly with the first, the election of Netanyahu, and he's stayed in ever since, the periodic uh, assaults on Gaza, the stopping of the freedom flotilla, uh, to Gaza, um, and the rise of the BDS movement has renewed, there's been a new wave of pro-Palestine activism around the world that a key dimension of it is intersectionality. Women supporting the Palestinian, indeed uh, 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 Linda Sarsour being the co-chair of the Women's March is a good example of that. Gay people a lot of different groups that see a commonality of struggle. And this has really annoyed uh, the Israelis, but certainly that youthful discourse of intersectionality, you know, all victims stand together against the forces, uh, against the man, shall we say. <laughs> I think much more than even, you know, anti-imperialist ideology has really been a galvanizing force for young people. A sense that, that, there, is a, that there is a gated community, right? Mm. You see it literally in gated communities. You see it in President Trump talking about a wall. You see a wall in the West Bank. The idea that the powerful and the rich are creating walls and using brutal force to keep the poor and the dispossessed at bay. And I think that, even more than, like I said, abstract interest in Palestinians, has galvanized a lot of people around the world to say, well, this is a, a cause I can embrace because I, as a black person, see that happening to me. I, as a gay person, still face 
uh, persecution. You know, I as a woman still face, uh, we, we're having a Me Too movement. So this intersectionality, I think, has been a game changer beyond Netanyahu's election and things like that. That, that, that There's been a, a, a renewal in interest in global human rights, again, on a very simple level. There's us and there's the powerful them. And I think that's an appealing um, discourse for people. And again, one that has very much annoyed uh, the Israelis who have done a variety of things in response, which I could get into on another, another talk. Mm. Other questions about... Yes, sir. Well, I have, I have an, another sort of personal, personal question. Um, I, was at, I was in the second class of students at the Institute for Policy Studies in 1964-65. Mm. And, um, of course, I'm well aware that Israel-Palestine was not one of the issues that was dealt with by IPS when I was there or, or later on. Uh, but I was wondering if in your research you did, in fact, encounter any evidence about how Dick Barnett and Mark Raskin, specifically the people who established IPS, uh, had, you know, what their personal feelings were or anything that relates mm -hmm. to this. Um, I, I haven't found anything myself, and I'm just curious if you... Um, I looked at some archives, and I'm trying to remember, it was at, I think it was at Swarthmore, which they have a, the Peace Library has a whole host of different groups' records. Um, and I looked a lot at uh, Art Waskow has papers in at least two different places. So those two fellows I don't remember, but I do know that Waskow in 1969-70, and Joe Stork was one of the people, if any of you know Joe Stork, who gave a presentation, and there was a... Uh, Waskow tried to get some, like, brown bag lunches around this issue, and there was a lot of internal opposition. There was one fellow, I can't remember his name, but he was a scientist, but he was... He, he was there doing research, and, and he wrote this angry letter about uh, you know, these radical positions, so, sort of the, the, the radical think tank objecting to radical views, right? So, um, so there was, let me just say, I haven't seen all the records, um, but for what I have seen is that IPS was another example of friction in the left. Um, and another example, you know, you had Waskow who was Jewish, the, the, the scientist was himself Jewish, and, um, it, it emerged there too. Right. Yeah, very much so. I will quickly add that um, Sammy mentioned that uh, I, the book I came out before on, on how the black freedom struggle dealt with this issue, the civil rights generally lining up with Israel, the black power movement generally supporting the Palestinians. It was all part of the same research project. I mean, I had a much broader thing about forces for change in the 60s and how they approached this particular question. So. Um, if I didn't dwell, if I only dwelt really on the white left today, and particularly on um, Jewish members of, of the white left, uh, I had an entire book on how the Black Panthers and Malcolm X, and on the one hand, and Martin Luther King Jr. and Bayard Rustin, uh, on the other hand, how, how they all approached. So uh, if you're interested, I mean, I won't get any royalties if you buy both books from Stanford University Press, but I'm just referring that to you if you were interested in, in how black Americans were also dealing with this at the time. Any obstacles to getting it published that you can speak of? Not or? political ones. Um, yeah. Strangely enough, I had had two books done with Columbia University Press, and I just got, I, it went to my head, and I thought, oh, I'm just I'm an established author. I'll just hand them my next thing, and, and they didn't want it. Um, I said, well, this is really American history. I said, yeah. Well, you're a Middle Easternist. Yeah. Well, Americanists won't know who you are. Like, if we're at the American Historical <laughs> Association, how can we sell a book from someone they're going to go, who is this guy? And I said, well, my first book with you, even Middle, East, Middle Easterners would have said, who is this guy? I mean, I wasn't established. So, th strangely enough, I couldn't get my original publisher interested, and Stanford came in and loved it. But, again, we, we shaved it, and so it came out as two separate books. But politically, no, no, no problems. Um, I got excoriated uh, about a year, year and a half ago on the internet for comments I made, very matter-of-fact comments about Mark Lamont Hill and getting fired by CNN, this black commentator, and uh, somehow this, this, this paper in New York called the Algeminer um, uh, yes. decided that I was blaming Jews for getting him fired as a black guy. And, <laughs> okay. Uh, but no, no one's taken aim just yet at, at the new book, so we'll see. You're the boss. Yeah, I, uh, 
Uh, what I found, one of, one of the many things in your book that I found very interesting was the Neo He actually read it. <laughs> <laughs> I, re I reviewed it. <laughs> um, is the neoconservative turn uh, coming from the far left? Could you talk about how that evolved? In? Sure. Um, I mean, there were many reasons. I mean, you can read uh, uh, some of the, the uh, leading lights of the neoconservative movement, like Norman Podhoretz, who himself has said that many, but not all, but many of the leading lights in the neoconservative movement were themselves Jewish, who had started out as either socialists or, or even like Irving Kristol, an actual Trotskyist, that drifted to the right. I mean, Jean Patrick was in a socialist youth group. She's not Jewish, but she was in a socialist youth group. Um, and drifted to the right, in part, but Horitz argues, out of disenchantment for the left's treatment of Israel in the 60s. Uh, beyond their own personal emotional attachments, the, the argument was that here was this brave little country, you know, unlike the U.S., there were no hippie drug addicts, no peace <laughs> parades. Uh, uh, they were united in purpose. They, 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 you know, there was a kind of... Um, Nietzschean sense of, of you know, struggle against Soviet-backed uh, reactionaries. And, you know, a lot of them, besides having warm feelings for Israel personally, saw this as a model. And indeed, under the Reagan era, this kind of militant anti-Soviet, um, you know, we need to uh, be righting the world's wrongs and using the might of America to do so, um, fit in very well. Noam Chomsky, with whom I actually had a telephone conversation about this book project, had his own thoughts about the neocons. But yeah, a lot of them, uh, some of their, what you might call almost liberal humanitarianism, I mean, we need to make Iraq a better place and bring them democracy, which is really different from traditional conservatives, stemmed from kind of their left origins. Um, but the, anything to do with the CP, anything to do with the Soviet Union, I mean, they brought that militancy. Um, but certainly Israel, there's even a dissertation about this that's in my bibliography about the Arab-Israeli issue and, and how that featured into the growth of, of neoconservatism. Uh, and I think it definitely was a factor. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Where Dr. does Mata. J Street fit into the scheme that you... Well, I, I didn't, I, I remained, um, I mean, certainly reviewers, like you have said, it would have been great if I had kind of moved into the present, um, but I deliberately stayed anchored in that. But I think, I, I think they are, this circle the way, I mean, another impact of the 60s was this idea that criticizing Israel is anti-Semitic. Um, the logic being anti-Zionism is saying that the Jewish people should not have a nation state. Only Jews can't have a nation state. Everybody else can. Ergo, you're singling out the Jews. Mm -hmm. The French can have a nation state. The Serbs can have. So you're anti-Semitic. That was the argument. Now, to me, it's ahistorical to, to label Zionism merely as the idea of a Jewish state. It's the idea of a Jewish state in Palestine. And the result of that is, is the problem. Uh, in the minds of leftists. What happened to the Palestinians is the problem. Uh, but my point is that in 1972, the Israeli Foreign Minister, Abba Eban, called anti-Zionism the new anti-Semitism. And stemming from that, two years later, the ADL came out with a book called The New Anti-Semitism. And so there was a circling of the wagons, not only around Israel in general, but the idea that attacking Israel is tantamount to attacking Jews everywhere. And I think, you know, fast forward to, you know, the, the, the Begin years, the Shamir, and the later Netanyahu and Sharon, and then Netanyahu again, I think some in the American Jewish community said, look, this, this kind of building this ideological wall around any criticism of Israel, including things like the settlements in the West Bank, is just counterproductive. And I think that was a concession that the origins of which go back to my time period. There was a group in, in the mid-70s called Brera, which means alternative in Hebrew. It was one of the first examples of a group of, these weren't radicals, a lot of them were, were liberals and rabbis that said, look, we need to, in the wake of 73, the 73 war, it was like, look, this problem is nearly bringing now the Soviet Union the United States into nuclear war. We really need to rethink this. Uh, and it was shut down within just about two years, Bray Ra. But 
the or, the idea of can there be some generally liberal progressive let's talk about this kind of movements within the Jewish community uh, like J Street, its origins also go back to that time period mm -hmm. where people said this, this fortress mentality and pathologizing uh, you're an anti-Semite, you're a Jew, you're a self-hating Jew is right. getting us nowhere. Can we talk about this more rationally? Mm -hmm. So that too, even today, is a reflection of things that did happen at that time period. I don't know how much time we have, but can I ask a question? Um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We have time. All right. Do you mind if I ask Ellen? More questions. Well, you were uh, you were there. You were in this time period, and you were. Um, I wrote about you in the book. Uh, is there any um, sort of particular memories? Or, I mean, how did you, as someone um, very typical of the kinds of people I'm describing, um, face? You know, you traveled to Lebanon. You volunteered, and I'm sure you encountered a lot of grief. Um, back in Baltimore. I did. Um, how did, I mean, these comments I make, are, do you have any uh, personal reflections on these kind of things as someone who was there and living through these things? Well, I grew up in a post-Holocaust era and this concept of if you see something is wrong, you must speak out. And so I felt very early on there was something wrong with the Palestinians. The Palestinian issue, I worked at a Jewish hospital um, I was asked if I would go to Israel in 67 to help the Israelis and I knew that wasn't quite right. Um, but the minute you lay eyes on a Palestinian refugee camp, you know that something is very wrong and that it's wrong because, mm -hmm. because of the establishment of the State of Israel. But I also belong to a Jewish women's group and I remember Art Waskow's Freedom Seder. Mm -hmm. So there were a few of us that were progressive, but not too many. Mm -hmm. But you just have to keep pushing and fighting against it, because you know it's right. Mm -hmm. There was um, there was also a group he was involved with in the D.C. area called mm -hmm. Jews for Urban Justice. Uh, people like Sharon Rose, who later right. was with uh, Joe Stork and others who established Merup, right. and, uh, who similarly said, you know, I, this just didn't seem right to me, but... Um, it's just not right. It's just basically not right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thanks. I, it's simple. I was there. I was alive in the 60s, but, <laughs> um, but uh, not old enough to be part of all this, so I appreciate you. I love the trip back to the 60s with you. Oh, well, <laughs> we'll use trip uh, euphemistically, <laughs> tripping in the 60s. If any of you have ever seen this, it's a very famous photo of this... Uh, round 60s glasses, this woman holding a sign, I'm an American Jew and I can go live in Israel again. This Palestinian woman, I'm a Palestinian Arab and I can't go back. Uh, that's her. Her in the Rad de Karmi. Rad de Karmi. Yeah. Very, uh, I saw that picture in, in the late 70s and I later found out it was you. So. <laughs> there you go. Stick to your guns, yeah. It's not fair. <laughs> well, thanks again for your, uh, for your comments and, and for coming and listening. Um, I appreciate you being a patient audience. Thanks Thank for you.